are we alone? To this day, the inhabitants of planet Earth have looked to the stars for proof of other life. But the truth isn't out there, it's in here. Since World War II, the British government has been watching us, watching the skies. Buried in the vaults of the Ministry of Defense are thousands of reports on UFO sightings, some left unexplained. But now, after decades of secrecy, the files are being released. And for the first time, the truth about Britain's UFOs is revealed. A near mid-air collision. I can't speculate on what it was, I really can't. I mean, I don't know to this day what it was. A World War II bomber's close encounter. I don't talk about it too much to people, only, only close friends. An unidentified object caught on radar. And new evidence on one of the most celebrated UFO cases, the Welsh Roswell. If it could be shown that any UFOs were extraterrestrial in origin, people's entire belief system would fundamentally change. Strange, unexplained stories that leave many wondering if there really is life out there. What are three popular word searches on the internet? Perhaps the first two are no surprise. UFOs have an incredible hold on the popular imagination, but few myths have involved government investigations, surveillance and cover-ups. UFOs have. One person who knows just how seriously UFO sightings have been taken by the British authorities is ex-MOD operative Nick Pope. From 1952 onwards, it was decided that there really needed to be a, a small unit set up permanently to research and investigate the UFO phenomenon. And really from the 50s right up until 2009, the Ministry of Defence uh, did have a small project looking at the UFO mystery. Pope manned the UFO desk in the 90s helping add to the thousands of files the Ministry had gathered for decades. Now that they're being released from the vaults, key UFO eyewitnesses give their side of the stories. And UFO experts, skeptics and believers interrogate just what the MOD was keeping secret. Dr. David Clark is the journalist who helped first persuade the MOD to release the files. If you look in the files, there are thousands of unusual things that people have seen in the sky from right across the British Isles. There's absolutely no doubt that people see things in the sky that they can't identify. They always have done. Sixth of January, 1995. Two experienced pilots of a Boeing 737 carrying 60 passengers from Milan to Manchester report a near collision. It's an incredible sighting of an unidentified flying object which sends the authorities into a spin. In the Ministry of Defence files, there are, there are quite a number of incidents uh, involving uh, near misses between um, civil aircraft and unidentified flying objects. The most impressive um, of all was a report that was made um, by the crew of a, a British Airways 737. Speedbird 5061, overhead penines, nine miles. They were just about to enter this cloud bank, quite a clear sky, good sort of vision. Suddenly the first officer said he saw this object coming towards him uh, like an illuminated Christmas tree. so low in its approach and so close that you, auto you automatically ducked thinking there was going to be a collision. And this thing just zoomed past and immediately he turned to the captain and said, did you see that? The captain said, yeah, I saw it as well. Immediately the pilots radioed into Manchester control tower. There's a lot of, um, of concern amongst air crews about what damage could be done to the reputation if they became known as you know, the crew that see flying saucers. So it was interesting in this case that despite that, these two air crew decided that when they landed, they were gonna file an official air miss 
uh, report. So that would then trigger a full um, detailed investigation by the Civil Aviation Authority, which is exactly what happened. For the first time, the MOD files show how this extraordinary incident sparked a full-scale investigation conducted by aircraft near-miss investigator Anthony Booth. Well, it was unusual for a start because it was the only one in my memory in seven years of working in, in that particular department that I'd actually dealt with something like this. We could talk to the pilots, both the pilots. We would go through looking at radar recordings, radio tra uh, RT transcript recordings of the voices of the pilots, the recordings of what Manchester Air Traffic Control had to say. We just looked at anything that might sh shed some light on what this object might have been. The pilots now refuse to talk publicly about the near crash, but the MOD files recall what they told Anthony Booth at the time. My attention was initially focused on the glare shield in front of me, but I was diverted by something in my peripheral vision. The object had a number of small white lights, rather like a Christmas tree. The high speed of the object, although unable to estimate its distance, it was very close. There's a transcript of the conversation between the captain of the 737 and ground control. Yes, sir, this is Speedbird 5061. We just let something go down the right-hand side, just above us, very fast. And Manchester immediately come back and say, well, there's nothing seen on radar. Was it an aircraft? Well, it had lights. He went down the starboard side very quickly. Manchester say, and just above you? Uh, just slightly above us, yes. Manchester then advise them to keep an eye out for anything, but they can't see anything at all. Um, it must have been very fast. It's all gone down very quickly after it passed you, I think. OK, well, there you go. The Manchester control tower could not find any radar signal. To radar expert Doug Robb, this is extraordinary. And it says the likelihood of such activity escaping detection is remote as the area is well served by several radars and any movement at the levels in question would almost certainly have generated a radar response. Nothing was seen. So what was it that avoided radar detection? The MOD files showed that the investigators and pilots considered all the possibilities. It was a hang glider. The night be suicidal. Hang, hang glider would not be picked up uh, by normal radar, no. A comet. A meteor could be detected on re-entry if the radar was looking exactly in the right direction uh, as that piece of uh, debris went past at some speed. Military? Oh, maybe, but I didn't recognise it. But we're near a major airport. It would have shown up on the radar response. Spy plane? I don't think so. It didn't look like a stealth. Stealth aircraft uh, would not be picked up by normal radars. Spy plane's being kept secret, it's not going to be flying where people can see it. And certainly nowhere near uh, airliners. UFO? <laughs> Daft. I don't know. These pilots are not lying. They did have an unusual experience, which to them remains baffling. The files show the investigation seriously analysed the possibility of military activity. But they found no evidence from any official source. It seems most unlikely that such a flight would have been conducted so close to a busy international airport. So what was it? We revealed the conclusion, locked away in the MOD vault since 1995, reached by Anthony Booth's investigation. Most of the incidents that we looked at, we could arrive at some conclusion, definite conclusion. But in this case, we couldn't really. We had to come up with an assessment of cause and risk. Both the risk and the cause were unassessable. Degree of risk, unassessable cause unassessable. Really, that statement is, is, is really, really unusual to find that in an official air miss report, and it's basically saying we don't have a clue what was seen. What they'll say back at BA. I think they might rib us about this one. At the end of their, um, the summary of the working group's discussions, it says that there is no doubt that these pilots both saw an object and that it was of sufficient significance to prompt an air miss report. Unfortunately, the nature and identity of this object remains unknown. To speculate about extraterrestrial activity, fascinating though it may be, is not within the group's remit and must be left to those whose interest lies in this field. To some ufologists like Nick Pope, 
the absence of any real conclusion leaves serious and unanswered questions. Now, to me, this was quite extraordinary. UFO does not mean alien spacecraft, but clearly, in some people's minds, whether it was the pilot and the first officer, or whether it was the investigators at the Civil Aviation Authority or the Ministry of Defense, clearly somebody was thinking, well, maybe, just maybe, this is something extraterrestrial. I can't speculate on what it was. I really can't. I mean, I don't know to this day what it was. Um, all I know is that we, we, know, we can't assume we know everything in this day and age. Um, there may be things that we don't know about. The Manchester Near Miss Investigation shows just how seriously unexplained sightings were taken by the MOD. But the UFO desk had been receiving reports from pilots for decades. The files reveal sightings during World War II, and in some cases, these were considered so grave, they were referred right to the top of government. The newly released UFO files confirm what many experts suspected. The British government was investigating unexplained sightings as far back as World War II. I don't talk about it too much to people, only, only close friends who experienced um, perhaps um, flying during the war. Spring 1944. Britain was engaged in heavy bombing raids over Germany. Rumors of strange, unidentified missiles were getting through to top command. Considered a threat to public morale, the MOD files reveal that the order to keep them secret came right from the top. Sightings such as the one seen by gunner Bernard Dye. Now I have here a personal wartime diary. I'll read you an entry which I wrote on the 26th of April. Operation Essen. 300 aircraft raided Essen. Dai then recorded the most extraordinary sight. By unidentified objects, which I describe as just red balls of fire. This is the first time Bernard Dai has spoken on television about what happened that night. We left the target area and we were heading back towards Mildenhall, our base. We were heading across France. Everything appeared to be peaceful. Suddenly I saw three balls of fire coming up from below and reported this to our pilot, Arthur Horton, on the intercom. A few seconds afterwards, the rear gunner, Brian Harper, he observed two more red balls of fire. Immediately, Arthur was a bit perturbed, and were they fighters? No, not fighters, Arthur, just balls of fire coming towards us. Said to Arthur, no, evasive action, corkscrew, starboard, go, go, go. We traveled over 300 miles per hour. The aircraft was shaking like a leaf, and still they were following. The pilot was getting worried about burning the engines up. Uh, engineer, Dave, what about the engines? Never mind the engines, Skipper. Keep going, or something to that effect. The words were rather rude. It certainly gave me and the crew the willies to see them. After a short distance, these five red objects, they just got slower and they just, the red lights disappeared into the blackness below and um, we got safely home. Well, when we got back to uh, Mildon, all our base, you know, each crew is interrogated by intelligence officers and they just laughed at us. And this upset the pilot and, um, you know, he said, you wouldn't bloody well have been laughing if you'd have been sitting with us in the aircraft. What did Gunner Bernard Dye think they were? Didn't know what to think, but 
I, I, I thought they were just uh, a new weapon that the Germans had invented. Bernard Dye was not alone. Other World War II aircrew had also reported unexplained sightings. And we now know that at least one of these reports was suppressed. And the order to do so came right from the top. Wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill was so terrified the report would leak out, he ordered a 50-year blackout. Mr. Churchill declared that the UFO incident should be immediately classified for at least 50 years and its status reviewed by a future Prime Minister. Churchill's order referred specifically to a late World War II sighting made by a British air crew returning from a reconnaissance mission over Germany. The files record, My grandfather was present during a debate about an unexpected incident experienced by an RAF bomber crew. The MOD files show that the story originates from the grandson of Churchill's bodyguard, who had been present at an urgent meeting between the Prime Minister and the US commander of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower, who discussed the incident together. He um, was writing in to see if the ministry could confirm this story, that this guy who was the bodyguard was present at a discussion between uh, Winston Churchill and Eisenhower about a, a mysterious incident when the crew of a, a Royal Air Force reconnaissance aircraft that had seen this, um, this metallic object that had appeared by the side of, the, of their aircraft and it, had, it, it, it followed the aircraft and it behaved in a, in a, in a way that was completely uh, unexplainable in terms of it being you know, a, a German aircraft or any other sort of uh, Nazi um, um, flying machine that they were aware of. A leading aircraft expert was also at the meeting. He dismissed any possibility that it could be a missile, since a missile could not suddenly match its speed with a slower aircraft and then accelerate again. Churchill was determined this would go no further. Another person at the meeting raised the possibility of an unidentified flying object, at which point Mr. Churchill declared that the incident should be immediately classified. But the file goes further. One extraordinary line explains just how fearful Churchill was of public reaction to this UFO sighting, if it ever got out. This event should be immediately classified since it would create mass panic amongst the general population and destroy one's belief in the church. But the files also reveal that this wasn't the first time Churchill had got embroiled in UFO sightings. In October 1912, um, there was um, sightings of uh, mysterious lights in the sky um, over the, um, the dockyards at Sheerness in Essex. And Winston Churchill was the first Lord of the Admiralty and he, he had to uh, look into this and Churchill had to admit in Parliament that he couldn't explain what had been seen. The files show that even after the war, Churchill took a personal interest in unexplained sightings. In the aftermath of the, uh, the sightings in Washington, D.C. in 1952 that made all the news headlines, Winston Churchill again became interested and sent a memo to the Secretary of State for Air. What does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? Let me have a report at your convenience. Until now, Gunner Bernard Dye never knew there were other World War II sightings that Churchill wanted kept secret at such a critical time in the war. We showed him the newly released MOD file on Churchill. Well, after reading this report, it sounds, you know, really identical to, to what we, uh, we witnessed and saw that night. I haven't heard of this before, but it doesn't surprise me that he was told about it because Things happened during the uh, war years, and uh, these, there were other objects obviously appeared. It's interesting that during the 1940s, there were a very large number of sightings reported by aircrew, and uh, there are various Royal Air Force files at the National Archives um, that um, detail some of these reports, rocket phenomena that were described as, but they were never able to explain them. And at the end of the war, when they um, debriefed some of the Luftwaffe pilots, they, was, they said that they'd seen very similar things themselves, and they thought they were allied secret weapons. So is there an explanation as to what the air crew saw? Dave Clark has his own theory. They just thought that it was a combination of uh, misperception on, on part of the air crew. They were expecting enemy um, action because they were so charged up on adrenaline. 
UFO or not, the files show that the World War II leaders were desperate to keep such sightings away from the public. The next file reveals how, even decades later, the government was still panicking about UFOs. Many UFO experts believe that the Pitlockery file illustrates one of the most significant UFO conspiracies of recent times. It involves photographs of an unidentified object captured flying over a remote Scottish valley. The photos were sent to the MOD, but mysteriously went missing. Journalist Mark Pilkington has spent years trying to track down these UFO images. The Pitlockery photographs in the MOD files date back to the 4th of August, 1990, when two witnesses on the A9 near Calvine, near Pitlockery, allegedly saw a large diamond-shaped craft hovering in the air for about 10 minutes and took six photographs of it. And the object that they claimed to have seen was accompanied by two aircraft, which the MOD later identified as Harriers. The photographer has never been identified. He sent the six photographs to the Scottish Daily Record newspaper. The paper never ran the story. Instead, they referred them to the MOD for investigation. The Ministry of Defence took their own copies of the photographs, which have since disappeared. They, according to the files, sent the original negatives back to the Scottish Daily Record, which inexplicably never ran a story on the subject and never, never published the photographs and presumably returned them to the two men whose names have been removed from the file, so we can't ask the two men. So it mystery piled upon mystery. All that remains in the files is a photocopy of the alleged photographs. Ufologists later mocked up this photo of what was seen. But Nick Pope dealt with the original photos and file when he worked behind the MOD desk. Both the Defence Intelligence staff and the Joint Air Reconnaissance Intelligence Centre analysed this very carefully and the consensus was, was clear on this. This was a real object. It was maybe 25, 30 metres in diameter. I sat down with my opposite number from the Defence Intelligence staff at a briefing about UFOs. We discussed this photograph extensively. This was something that was of defence interest because clearly it could do something that we couldn't and we wanted that technology. The MOD was determined to play down the incident. There's an interesting briefing by the Ministry of Defence press office um, on defensive lines to take if these photographs made it into the newspapers and they were asked questions about this. And there's, there's a list that basically says that we have looked at the photographs and no definitive conclusions have been reached regarding the large diamond-shaped object. And if they were pressed by the media, they were told to say all sighting reports received by the Ministry are referred to the staff in the departments which are responsible for the air defence of the UK. During his time with the Ministry, Pope had a blown-up copy of the photograph on his office wall until it was personally taken down by his superior. One suggestion was that this was a secret prototype American spy plane. My head of division convinced himself that this probably was some secret aircraft or drone and he ordered that this be removed. We know from the files that there was a lot of internal discussion about, you know, were the Americans flying this incredible um, um, spy plane, you know, and if so, why had they not asked for permission, you know, for this thing to fly through British airspace? Journalist Mark Pilkington believes that events at the time could well have influenced what people thought they had seen. This was just uh, two days after the first Gulf War had broken out, and there were certainly great deployments of aircraft uh, towards the Middle East and the UK was a kind of uh, sort of stop-off point and a, and a sort of launch pad for a lot of those aircraft. The MOD were clearly worried about public reaction, just as Churchill had been four decades earlier. So was there a cover-up by the MOD over the mysterious Pitlockery photographs? There's a possibility that the Ministry of Defence destroyed these images possibly because they thought that they were some American spy plane that uh, they'd rather uh, we didn't know about, or maybe uh, 
uh, if, if this thing genuinely remained unexplained because we simply didn't want the embarrassment of saying that there might be things in our airspace with speeds and maneuvers that exceed everything that we've got and, and yet which remain unexplained. However, all we're basing this on, we should make clear, is a very grainy, fuzzy black and white image that for all I know could have been drawn by a child with crayons. Mark Pilkington is still looking for the real Pithlockery photographs to find out just what did put Britain's defences to the test. But six years later, on Britain's east coast, another UFO sighting sparks off a full-scale military investigation and a direct challenge to the Secretary of State for Defence. In 1996, the Ministry of Defence was drawn into a serious breach of UK defences by a UFO over East Anglia. MOD files reveal it not only involved the police, Coast Guard and RAF, but a call to the Defence Secretary to scramble jet fighters. I'm very concerned about an incident that occurred off the East Anglian coast recently involving a visual unidentified flying craft sighting that was correlated by various different military radar systems. Why weren't our jets scrambled? It was one of the biggest UFO scares ever. And it all started one quiet October night on the East Coast. It was the police officers, actually, who phoned in the first reports. There's an extract from that. In the early hours of the morning, the police are saying, we can see a strange red and green rotating light in the sky directly southeast from Skegness. It looks to be high in the sky directly over the wash. The patrol officers reported the sighting to the station sergeant. I immediately phoned it through to the Skegness control room, who relayed it onto Great Yarmouth Coast Guard Maritime Rescue, suspecting it might be an incident over the sea. We had a report at about quarter past three local time from uh, Skegness police, and they could actually see this light in a southeasterly direction. We were uncertain of what it was at the time, and uh, we immediately made a report to the local air defence radars to see if they could see anything. The call went through to RAF Neatishead, the most important air defence centre in southern England. Transfer radar has a contact bearing at 221 degrees at... They noticed that on one of the radars, or a blip that they couldn't um, identify that wasn't an aircraft. Could the mysterious radar blip and the strange lights seen by the police be the same thing? Panic calls from the public started to come in. No, no, I don't think they're invading. The call was put out to shipping to keep a lookout for unidentified lights. Then a tanker came back. MV Conicaster Yarmouth, we're seeing a group of lights above the wash. The vessel at sea was the uh, Conicoast, and she was in much this sort of area. At 3.50 a.m., patrol officer PC Leyland rushed onto the police station roof to video the strange lights and managed to capture five minutes of footage now showing a single stationary white light. News of the sighting spread quickly through the UFO grapevine. The transcript of the conversation between the Coast Guard and the, um, the police and the trawler crew got, um, was leaked to the, uh, to the local news and it suddenly became this huge UFO incident that, um, that got to the attention of the local MP. The sighting gathered such momentum, even local Labour MP Martin Redmond got embroiled and started asking difficult questions. Martin Redmond said, look, you've got police officers seeing UFOs, you've got Royal Air Force officers tracking them on radar, and yet you don't even get the aircraft uh, in the air to take a look at this thing. Here's a copy of the letter that uh, Martin Redmond MP sent to uh, the Right Honourable Mike Michael Portillo, Secretary of State for Defence, and he says, I am very concerned about an incident that occurred off the East Anglian coast recently involving a visual unidentified flying craft sighting, which was correlated by various different military radar systems. While I'm interested in finding out what was seen, my primary concern stems from the absolute shambles that such an event seemed to cause. So he's really sort of having a go at the Ministry of Defence and saying, you know, why didn't you react to this? What are the, what are the RAF doing? So this really stung the, the RAF. The files reveal a picture of chaos. The letter sparked off an MOD investigation to explain the RAF's resistance. 
Doug Robb was operations manager on the night. We showed him the MOD findings. He wasn't surprised by the conclusions. This diagram is the radar plots uh, over Boston on that night. And in summary, uh, it shows that Claxby picked up the object, but it didn't move, and it was on land. And after investigation, uh, it was decided that it was uh, the church tower, the Boston stump, as it's known. The files were certain this was the culprit. The church is known in aviation circles as the Boston stump and appears occasionally on some radars in certain radar propagation conditions. They said that this was a completely separate phenomenon to the bright stationary lights that had been seen by the police from Boston and Skegness and by the, um, the tanker crew. The report concluded there was no justification to order the scramble of RAF fighters, much to the chagrin of the local MP, Martin Redmond. You'd scramble for a high-speed incoming aircraft 200 miles away, but you're not going to scramble the aircraft for a fixed object on land. I mean, what's the threat? If what the radar picked up was indeed a church, what then would the mysterious lights seen by the police and the tanker crew? The MOD scrutinized the police video footage. It suggests a distant celestial source. The MOD sent the footage onto the Royal Greenwich Observatory for analysis. Their report has been kept buried since 1996 in the MOD files. UFO and astronomy expert Ian Ridpath was shown their conclusions and the police video. If you look at the police video, you can see it's just a, a bright dot of light just sitting there, not appearing to do anything. So to me, this shows that even the uh, most impeccable witnesses can actually make what is really a, a basic mistake, which is just misidentifying bright celestial objects. Well, the most common culprit is the planet Venus. In fact, it's called the queen of the UFOs, and this is because it's the brightest object in the night sky after the sun and the moon, which could have been what the police were seeing. He also believes there's an explanation for the colors of the lights. When the camera zooms in, very often the camera will completely lose focus, and, and you can actually see some, some odd shape to the light, um, which is actually the diaphragm of the camera. But this doesn't explain what the tanker crew observed. The MOD investigation found that they saw a light coming from a different direction to Venus, and they were baffled. These lights remain unexplained. But expert Ian Ridpath believes there is an answer. The object that the tanker saw to the north, I think, was another bright star called Vega, which is also just appearing to twinkle and, and flash multicolored lights. UFO expert and skeptic Dave Clark believes there is a reason why this escalated into such a major incident. This happened in 1996, which was the very height of the popularity of the X-Files series on, um, on TV. It was the biggest sort of um, year, the 1996-97, in terms of number of reports they received um, since 1978. So is this case closed for East Anglia? Or will more mystery emerge, just as it has, with one of Britain's most celebrated cases that refuses to go away, the Welsh Roswell? In 1974, in North Wales, thousands of people experienced a violent earth tremor and lights were seen falling from the sky. Some ufologists believe a UFO crashed and there's been a cover-up ever since of the Welsh Roswell. Oh, a heck of a bath, yeah. Oh, yes, it's like a tremor it was in the house, shook the houses, we are in new houses. And it seemed to come right on top of the red and so the house is coming down. There were lights coming from the top of the mountain, just up over there. 24th of January, 1974, at 21.50 GMT. Five bodies, spectacularly incandescent, were observed traversing the sky. New information has been revealed that opens the mystery further. Named as one of the main witnesses in the Berwyn incident is Hugh Lloyd, then a 14-year-old farmer's son. Just after 8.30 p.m., Hugh's family felt the massive earth tremor. It was a frightening experience. Almost 40 years on, 
Hugh still remembers that day as if it were yesterday. It was like this thud. And straight away, the whole place started shaking very violently. The light flickered in the, tele light on, in the picture on television, snow on the, on the screen. But uh, we, did a, you know, we were all frightened. We didn't have a clue what it was. And uh, Enoch said, there, it must be an explosion. And then the phone started, started ringing. Hello? Like neighbors, Hello? you know, phoning to ask, did you feel that? And then roughly about uh, 20 minutes, there was a knock on the door. And there was a police officer there. And he said, we've got, had reports as a plane crash that come down on the Bedouin. And we'd like to commandeer your Land Rover to go up there. Me being 14, I said, well, Enoch, you better drive it. We carried on up the mountain about half a mile, maybe three quarters. And we drove up the track and uh, we stopped, got out and got uh, torches and it was very quiet and very dark, but, you know, nothing to be seen. How are we going with the torch? One of them said, um, there's nothing here. It's too quiet, can't, can't see anything. We might as well go down. So we turned back to the vehicles and as we were approaching the vehicles, we saw this very bright white light. Betty, who It's up the valley. Just behind those trees there, up to the left in the valley between those two mountains. A very bright white light, you know, from, coming up from the ground, up, you know, pointing upwards. But it was, you know, very, very bright. I knew it was coming from the ground, but we, we couldn't actually see the source of the light because it was, you know, in the valley itself, being hidden. The light didn't look like a plane crash. It was too white for a fire. It didn't last for very long, 20 seconds or at the most. They searched the mountainside, but there was no sign of a crash. So what was the light? Ufologist Andy Roberts has researched the Berwyn UFO for years. Although a skeptic, he admits there is a central mystery to the incident involving another key witness. At a village nearby called Llandervel, um, there was a district nurse called Pat Evans. She felt the explosion there, and because she was a nurse and had all the, uh, the medical equipment, thought, if a plane's crashed, I could get up there and give much-needed help until the emergency services arrived. Pat Evans was with her two teenage daughters, four miles from Hugh Lloyd when the earth tremor hit. So she picked up her two young daughters, got them in the car, drove the 10, 15 minute drive up onto the B4391 road, expecting to see an aircraft crashed and in flames. This is the road that she was driving on, and it's a road that she knew very well. So she had no problems driving up here at night. And obviously she was out there looking for uh, what she thought was going to be a plane disaster. And just as she came out from the other side of this uh, copse of trees, she was absolutely astonished to see far across the hills to the left, a huge ball of uh, red, white, orange, pulsating light. Whatever the object was, it was too far from the road to be reached on foot. Pat and her daughters watched, astounded at the ball of light, slowly pulsating and changing colour. She described it as being half the size of the moon, and around this object were moving torch lights and vehicle lights. She realised that it clearly wasn't a crashed aircraft and that someone or some people were there attending to whatever it was. And realising that, she drove back home and went to bed, and to this day is completely mystified by what it was. So what did Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd see that night? We reveal that even the arrival of the mysterious men in black couldn't provide all the answers. The unidentified sightings by Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd in Berwyn, Wales in 1974 have gone down in UFO folklore. The recently released MOD files have added even more mystery. Researchers from the British Geological Survey were quickly dispatched to Berwyn to investigate an earth tremor that had registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. Immediately after the earthquake, we were getting a lot of reports, uh, some of them rather complex ones about lights in the sky, lights on the hill. So I brought a small team of people down to ask the local people around here what they'd seen, what they'd heard, what they'd felt. The British Geological Survey team have become known in Berwyn legend as the Men in Black, as they were dressed in dark suits, official looking, and were going door to door. Some people seem to think the whole event was rather suspicious. 
and that we simple scientists from the Geological Survey had something to do with suspicious events around here. Files containing Chris's notes recall his interview with nurse Pat Evans, who saw the unidentified light. I have here the notes that I made when I talked to Pat Evans. She felt the shaking, but also she was very concerned about lights that she saw in the sky. She thought there was a, a big red light, like a, a glowing red fire. This is a copy of one of the maps that we, with our team, used uh, when we were going around the area talking to people. And uh, we were able, therefore, to put on the map exactly where we got that interview from, and therefore exactly what that person saw, heard, and felt. This British Geological Survey map, buried in the vaults, is a revelation. It shows the anomalous light seen by Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd both appeared in the same small area of hillside at the same time. Ufologist Andy Roberts returns to the same spot on the mountainside where Pat and her daughter saw the UFO, and where Pat Evans told her story to Andy Roberts in 1998. When I brought uh, Pat Evans up onto this mountain road in 1998, and she told me her story then, she, I photographed her. And the photograph that um, I took showed her pointing to where she saw what she saw in 1974. And judging by this photograph, she was pointing over there, and which we know is where the police and farmers were searching that night. Pat Evans was on the Sanganuk to Welshpool Road, which is just, well, there, just, just beyond the forestry there. So if she was there, she, she probably saw the same lights as we saw. You know, because it's dead in line. I'm sure, I'm nearly positive that's the same lights as she, she saw. The recent files show the MOD's explanation for the sudden explosion and mysterious lights. Subsequent search of the hillsides in question revealed no sign of impact, however. The meteorological office considered that these sightings could have been occasioned by a bolide, that is to say, a meteor which enters the Earth's atmosphere and burns up before reaching the ground. A private investigation done on behalf of the British Astronomical Society concluded, however, that the meteor may in fact have disintegrated over Manchester and that its appearance was preceded at 8.30 p.m. by an Earth tremor in the Berwyn Mountains with which it has no connection. So they were saying again, these are two things that happened coincidentally on the same night. You've got a meteor burning up in the atmosphere, and also you've got an earth tremor. So is this incredible coincidence, two separate natural phenomena, a meteor shower and an earthquake happening simultaneously, in itself a complete answer to the mystery? Many UFO believers think not. They believe the files failed to answer the big question, what was the source of light Pat Evans and Hugh Lloyd saw on the ground? So what Pat saw is an absolute mystery. I don't think it's a UFO for a minute, although it is an unidentified something. It appeared to be on the ground. If anything, it's an unidentified grounded object. Um, but it's a mystery. So in and amongst all the, the hype about aliens and extraterrestrial crashing, in amongst the truth and the fact about an earthquake and bowline meteors, what we have is a mysterious sighting of a stationary, large, glowing object on the ground for at least 10 minutes. So is this case closed for Berwyn? there are still many unanswered questions. The Berwyn Mountain incident is, I, I think in many people's minds, it's not case closed. Some people believe that the release of these files is itself uh, disinformation and that the Ministry of Defense is still covering up some great secret truth about UFOs. The MOD has agreed to release all the UFO files over time. But will all the secrets be revealed? It seems that the public is not ready to give up believing just yet. For some people, UFOs are with us for a long time to come. Well, until the real ones show up. Some people suggest that this drip feeding of information to the public about UFOs is getting people ready for the day when it is announced that actually these things are real. Things are real. Things are real. Things are real. Things are real.